Jeremy Hunt, welcome to The Economist Asks. Hello. So at the time that we're sitting down with you here at The Economist, the latest polling shows you inching ahead of your Cabinet colleague Michael Gove, so in second place, to Boris Johnson, who seems to be leading the field on MPs' nominations. Only two of you go forward to the membership for the final runoff. Why should MPs back you? What makes you different from Michael Gove or indeed Boris Johnson? Well, there are lots of things that are very different about me. I'd be the first prime minister who's been an entrepreneur by background, for example. But the central issue that is going to dominate this leadership campaign is who is most likely to deliver Brexit. And the European Parliament elections and the local election results have been a wake-up call to the Conservative Party that we will be obliterated in a general election if we have not delivered what we promised to do in the last general election. And we, at the moment, are in a situation where we have some very bad choices. Uh, if we carry on as we're doing at the moment, uh, Parliament will block a no-deal Brexit and the EU will block a better deal that would perhaps get through Parliament. And so the question, the reason I think I will progress in this campaign and get forward and, and hopefully win the campaign is because I am saying to people, let's be honest about the choices we actually face and let's choose the person who can give us some better choices, some better options, options that we don't have at the moment. And as Foreign Secretary, I've been talking to European leaders for the last year. I've got a sense of the complexities of the issues, of the rigidities in the European Union. And I'm not going to say this is easy, but I will say that if we go in with a very hard line approach, we will just get a hard line response. We'll get to October the 31st and nothing will have changed. And then the only likely way to resolve this would be a general election. And I think that would put Jeremy Corbyn in Downing Street and be absolutely catastrophic for the Conservative Party. That's the, the Labour leader, your opposition, party main opposition. So you've called it political suicide to allow a no-deal Brexit to happen. Subsequently, you seemed to suggest that you would negotiate as if no deal were possible. Can you just absolutely clarify for us what is your position on no deal? Yes, um, I will. I didn't say no deal was political suicide. I said having a general election would be political suicide. And if your only way to deal with a parliament that is blocking no deal was to have a general election, that would be political suicide. I've always believed that we should keep no deal on the table. Um, because and you I think, still think that? I still do. And I also, then it might happen if you keep it on the table. Well, it might be taken away by Parliament, and that's what's already happened this year. That's why we have to be honest about the parliamentary arithmetic that we face. Um, and I've always said that if the only way to deliver Brexit was leaving without a deal, and that really was the only way to do it, then I would do that. But because I think in the end, the democratic risk of not delivering Brexit is higher than the economic risk of no deal. But I would do it with a heavy heart because of the risks to our businesses, the risks to the union. And I would not do it if there was a chance of a good deal that could get through Parliament. And what I want to be is the Prime Minister who gets that good deal on the table, negotiates it. I'm a businessman by background. Um, I negotiated the junior doctor's contract, which is one of the longest contract negotiations we've ever had, uh, a very bitter industrial dispute. But I also did the BBC licence fee in less than 24 hours in 2010. So I've, I've got experience of negotiations. Both. You're not going to do this one in 24 hours, are you? I, I do you think, think so. No Deal is as bad as The Economist has been pretty clear all along? And we've done very deep dives on it from a number of perspectives that we think it is pretty catastrophic for the UK economy and not very good for... Europe either. Do you share the depth of feeling that The Economist has? I agree. No deal would not be good for the British economy. Um, uh, it would have a, a significant impact on our economic growth. Um, it would also be bad for the EU. Um, the extent to which it will be bad really depends on the context. If you had, if you like, a hostile no deal where uh, you know, we were threatening not to pay our bills um, and there was a, an atmosphere of animosity, then the economic consequences could be really very damaging indeed. If you had a, a more constructive atmosphere um, with both sides having tried very hard but not able to reach a conclusion, 
uh, then the consequences could be mitigated. And you can't know until you're actually in the situation which of those two it's going to be. But How high is the probability of a no deal in percentage terms, roughly? Uh, well, I can't say that. I mean, my, my view is that um, Parliament has already shown that it won't allow no deal. It's already passed a bill over the government's head, taking control of the order paper in Parliament, completely unprecedented. Um, in order to require the Has Prime Parliament Minister... overstepped? Well, you know, I personally think that uh, Parliament should leave these matters to the executive, but we are a parliamentary democracy. We have to follow the law, and if Parliament makes a law, even the Prime Minister has to follow it. So I think it is very unrealistic to think that Parliament wouldn't do that again. We just interviewed Rory Stewart, who's a uh, contender, perhaps even more of a soft Brexit contender in this race for, for this show also. He was very clear that he wouldn't serve under Boris Johnson. Are there any candidates that you would or wouldn't serve under in this race? No. You'd serve under anyone? I, I think there are outstanding candidates and I think that uh, uh, people uh, should do their duty. Um, but I have to say that I also hope they would all be willing to serve under me because I think what we have to do as a party is come together. Uh, this has been a very damaging period. If we don't deliver Brexit, we are finished as a party. And if we don't unite, we won't deliver Brexit. Why are you a better candidate than Michael Gove? All candidates have their strengths and weaknesses. I'd rather talk about my own strengths than, than, than other people's weaknesses. Oh, in, my case, in my case, uh, I wouldn't just be the first prime minister who's been an entrepreneur by background. I'd be the first prime minister who's run the NHS, the fifth largest organization in the world. I'd be the first prime minister who's won a marginal seat in a quarter of a century. These are things that are going to be helpful uh, facing the challenges we face. Is it fair to change leaders in this slightly old donkey derby that we're in um, with a very small selectorate at a time of absolute national crisis without the country being consulted? Well, this is what happens in a parliamentary democracy because um, political parties form governments and they elect their leaders according to their own rules. And, and that's how it is. Um, but in the end, what will not change with the uh, leadership election is the parliamentary arithmetic, the MPs that people have voted to send to parliament. And that's why a new leader has to recognise the reality of that arithmetic that it is likely to block no deal and that therefore the only way through the conundrum is to find a better deal and the question is who is the candidate who is most likely to get that better deal? We've looked at other ways out of this impasse and in depth at a second referendum in some form. I think you have consistently opposed that but what's your key argument for not simply going back to where we started. This started with going to the people and asking them whether they wanted to remain or leave uh, the EU. What would be wrong with going back? Well, let me put it this way. Let's say you had a second referendum and the result was exactly reversed and 52% voted remain and 48% voted leave. If that happened, would that settle the issue? You'd have 48% of the country that had voted twice to leave they would be absolutely furious and they would say, well, you've had a second referendum. Can we have a third one? Can we have a fourth one? Uh, and uh, they would think it was profoundly undemocratic. So I don't think a second referendum solves anything. Would the you way rule it out in any circumstances? I will not vote for a second referendum. And let me say this. The way you unite, you unite the party, sorry, the way you unite the country is by delivering Brexit, but finding a form of Brexit that works for the 48% who voted to remain as well. And many of the people who voted to remain in the EU had perfectly legitimate concerns about Brexit. And one of the things we need to do is to reassure them that, for example, well, you we're not... voted to remain. Yes. So um, you're reassuring well, yourself. Well, we can go into those reasons as well. But one of the things we need to do is to reassure them that we're not going to change the fundamental character of the country. We're not going to pull up the drawbridge, put down the shutters, say foreigners not welcome. Um, no, it's but I must, ask you, a... sorry, I must ask you, did you regret voting remain in the re referendum? Well, I voted remain because I was worried about the economic risks of leaving. Um, and the economy has proved to be much more robust since the Brexit decision than uh, we thought. If you remember, the Treasury was putting out forecasts saying we would have property price crashes and, uh, you know, well, an Brexit immediate recession. Yet, no, but they promised that from the moment you decided to leave, these things would happen, and they haven't. So, so knowing what you know now, would you vote to leave? Well, I, if there was a referendum again, uh, I would vote to leave because I think this is the only way we will resolve this issue. 
So you've been Foreign Secretary uh, for over a year now at the heart of the Brexit negotiations. They haven't succeeded. How did we get here that we need to, to learn from and how much of it is the fault of Theresa May? Well, look, I don't think this is the time in her last week as leader of the Conservative Party to be pointing any fingers. As you say, we weren't successful in the end, and I think we're all very disappointed that that didn't happen. What can we learn? Well, one of the reasons that the EU stopped negotiating with us and making concessions was because they didn't believe that the British government and Theresa May could deliver a majority in Parliament. So I think as we go back into this process again, we need to assemble a negotiating team that has on that team the DUP, uh, the ERG, which is a, a wing of the Conservative Party, uh, Scottish and Welsh Conservatives, so that the EU know that any proposal made by the British government can be delivered through the British Parliament. I think it's one of the first rules of negotiation. People have to think they can bank your promises. And uh, if we do that, and if we approach the negotiations in a, uh, in a constructive tone, um, I believe there is a deal there because it is uh, very much in the EU's interests to come to a deal as it is in our interests. Um, but if we go in with the wrong approach, uh, they will just sit and wait for Parliament to block no deal. We'll end up having a huge debate over an extension. And I think for people on the Conservative side, the thing to remember is that Labour is beginning to look like a more attractive option for the European Union because uh, it supports the customs union and it looks like it's going to support a second referendum. So I think we need to be very careful not to find ourselves tipped into a general election uh, which would do untold damage. Donald Trump has just been visiting. You've spent some time with him. How did you find him? He was ebullient. Uh, on good form. Uh, I think he enjoyed the state visit. I think he was very moved by the uh, D-Day commemorations. Um, and, you know, he is a larger than life politician. And, you know, you can love or loathe Donald Trump. W but what from about the you? U you love or loathe Donald Trump? Well, I have a lot of respect for the president. I don't agree with him on everything. And, you know, I disagree with him on climate change, for example, um, on the Iran nuclear deal. But what I notice about America is that they have a GDP growth rate that is double ours. And I think that at the point of Brexit, one of the things that we need to consider very carefully is what we do to turbocharge the British economy. And why is that? Just think what a, a Remain supporting newspaper like The Economist, what would make you in 10 years' time, through gritted teeth, write an editorial entitled Britain's Surprising Brexit Success? Well, the answer is you might just write that editorial if our growth rate has been higher than European Union countries over that 10 years. You'd definitely write the opposite if it had been lower. So I think the name of the game, if we want to make a success of Brexit, is to turbocharge the economy. That's why I've said I think we should cut corporation tax to 12.5%, which is Irish levels, as a, as a strong signal that on the point of Brexit, we are determined to be in the most pro-business, pro-enterprise, high-tech, greenest economy in Europe. What do you say to those who say actually many of his values are not those uh, that should be emulated or celebrated and who have wished for a moment perhaps of, of those at the very top of politics like yourself to send a, a clearer message about that to this president? Well, look at the reason that President Trump came to Portsmouth yesterday to commemorate the D-Day landings exactly 75 years ago. Uh, that was a moment of profound importance because we were celebrating an alliance between Britain and America that far transcends... Well, that's in the past. Oh, no, no, hang uh, Donald on. Donald Trump's you've got to let me answer, Anna. That far offenses, if such no, they no, are, no. are happening now. But you've got to let me answer the question. That alliance transcends any individual politicians. So when you look at the world today and you see a much more aggressive Russia, you see a more autonomous China... You have to ask yourself, is that alliance between the UK and the USA, the two countries that created the international order that has made the world richer, uh, more peaceful, 
record life expectancy, uh, record numbers of diseases it like cured. Saying, no, it does that a lot. You along no, a little but, bit, but it you've got to like let me answer the question. Despite, well, no, no, answer got to, the question. Yeah, I am what? answering the question. Go I'm on. saying you've got to say to yourself. Is that alliance still relevant? And I think it is. And in the end, I think that America is the leader of the free world and we need to work alongside America. And as I say, with President Trump, there are things we disagree with, but on things like the economy, on the, his, the way he has boosted growth in the American economy, there's lots we can learn from. But underneath all of that is uh, the protection, the defense, the sustaining of a world order that I think has been uniquely successful. President Trump this week promised the UK a phenomenal trade deal, but one where everything is on the table, and that includes NHS procurement, which you know a lot about as a former health secretary. How realistic is that? It does seem to be something of a requirement from the American side, however strongly many Brits feel that the NHS uh, should be in their hands and, and not those of uh, American companies in any meaningful form. Well, I spent a bit of time explaining to President Trump about the NHS when he was over here. You mean he uh, didn't understand it first? Well, he's the American president. I didn't expect him to understand everything about our healthcare care system here. Um, and he actually clarified in an interview with Piers Morgan that he was not seeking to put NHS procurement on the table. Uh, when we talk about healthcare care products, if you're talking about medicines, uh, medical devices, these things are freely traded around the world anyway. They can be part of any trade deal. But NHS procurement, uh, the ownership of the NHS, that's never going to be for sale under any prime minister. I'd like to turn uh, finally to, to something else. Um, and that's the Huawei uh, case and particularly what the implications would be for security. Obviously, the American administration there has taken a very tough line with the company. Uh, you've managed to calm some concerns about that. I think about uh, their equipment being used as a backdoor to espionage. But the first of uh, 5G networks in the UK has already been launched and Huawei hardware is in it. Are we locking the stable door after the horse has built it? Well, we have to make a decision as to the extent that we use Huawei. We haven't made that final decision. And the considerations are firstly what you've just said, which is the you know, espionage issue. Can you be sure that that equipment isn't being used as a backdoor? Um, and we have some of the best technical experts in the world. We look at their advice very, very carefully. But the second issue is a strategic one, which is, you know, China has its Made in China 2025 program where they're explicit that they want to get an 80% global market share of um, telecoms equipment technology. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, 5G is going to be something that dominates our lives in a way that 3G and 4G never did because it will uh, control our driverless cars. It will control the heating in our house. And our that fridge. may be a reason why the more, and you've had this debate in Cabinet, as we know, because it kept being leaked. Um, it, a lot of people just feel, therefore, you should just be much firmer in shutting Huawei out. Well, I'd say this is not about China. This is about whether we want to become technologically dependent on any third country when we know that these technologies are going to be so important to our future. Do you feel that China is an enemy to Western democracies and to the United Kingdom as things sound? How did you characterise China? You know a lot of, about it. Your uh, wife is Chinese. You've travelled there extensively. What is our relationship with China? They're absolutely not an enemy. Uh, we should welcome the rise of China. Uh, when China catches up with the United States, we should remember, which some people say could happen as soon as 10 years' time, we should remember their GDP per head will still only be a quarter of the U.S.'s GDP per head. And, you know, why shouldn't they want to raise their people out of grinding poverty? Um, but China has to make choices about the kind of country it wants to be and the way that it uses its power. And we don't share their values when it comes to our human rights and the rule Cyber of law. Cyber warfare. I've just, just been talking to a very major figure in the armed forces so, who talked about it being relentless was his word. Are you sort of soft peddling a bit on, on the threat? Not at all. And I think the, the ex first of all, I think we do need to find a way to live alongside China because uh, they are a powerful and successful country. But the closeness of our relationship to China will be determined by choices that China itself makes.
And did you win that argument with the American delegation over this week? I think the, the economists argued in favour of a compromise on Huawei, not so perhaps different from where you are in this argument. Uh, the Americans did seem to come in all guns blazing, saying they really would like Britain to drop Huawei. Did anything move this week? Well, we listened very carefully to what the Americans say. Um, but in the end, we will make a decision based on the British national interest. They're our closest ally. Um, we have a fantastically important military and intelligence relationship with them. We don't always agree with them, but we will certainly listen to them very carefully. What are the chances that next time we see you, you're the leader of the Conservative Party and indeed the Prime Minister? Well, all I'll say is you get slightly longer odds on me than some of the other candidates. So I'm the one if you want to make money. There's the entrepreneur. Jeremy Hunt, thank you very much. Thank you, Anne.